Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Today we're gonna to look at a really nice problem from Lewis Carroll. And I think what makes this problem so nice is it's so easy to state, but it has a bit of a complicated solution, but not quite so complicated that it loses everyone. Okay, so let's see what the statement is. We say three random points are taken in an infinite plane, and then our goal is to determine the probability that these three points are vertices of an obtuse angled triangle. So in other words, one of the angles of the triangle is obtuse. Let's notice that since the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, only one of those angles can be obtuse. And I wanna point out that our solution is modeled after a solution in a Math Magazine article from April 2018 from Joseph Privet and Michelle Privet. And so they actually extend this problem quite a bit. And so if you wanna see a pretty big generalization of this problem, I would urge you to check this out. You can easily find it online if you just search like this. Okay, so how are we gonna start? So we'll start with our random three points in the plane, connect them together to make a triangle, and then without loss of generality, we'll name that triangle ABC, and then take AB to be the longest side length. And then that side length will set equal to length L. But really there's nothing special about L. So the next thing that we'll do is we'll rescale our triangle so that its longest side length has length two. So that's like doing a contraction of the plane by a scale of something like two over L. Next up, we'll put two circles into the situation. We'll put a circle centered at A with radius two and another circle centered at B with radius two. And notice that C must lie in the intersection of these circles. And that's because the intersection of these circles is exactly all of the points that will make AC and BC less than AB. And let's recall that AB was supposed to be the longest side of our triangle. Okay, next up, we're gonna put another circle into the situation. And the other circle will have a diameter of AB. And now here's where it gets pretty interesting. Notice that if C lies exactly on that circle, then you get a right angle. And that's because the angle that subtends a diameter of a circle is exactly a right angle. That's a pretty well-known fact from like a high school geometry class. Furthermore, if C is outside of that triangle, but then inside of the I shape, we see that we have all acute angles. But if C is inside the inner circle, then we have an obtuse angle. And that's in fact the only way to get an obtuse angle. Okay, now that we've seen this construction built out, let's get this picture on the board and also put it in the Cartesian coordinate plane. If you're looking to start your own domain, personal website, or online store, look no further than Squarespace. As a website myself, I can tell you that Squarespace is the best of the best. We mathematicians need to step up our website game. Too many math websites are stuck in the 1990s. Squarespace has tons of templates that offer awesome customization options with no coding required. Although you can access the code if you'd like. There's even an easy LaTeX integration that I have on my website. Whether you're already running an online store or have just begun your journey into web design, Squarespace has the tools you need to succeed. So what are you waiting for? Go check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Michael Penn to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And once again, I'd like to thank Squarespace for supporting this channel. So here's our setup onto the board. So notice I scaled everything and I put AB along the X axis. So that means A is at the point negative one zero, B is at the point one zero. That means AB has length two. That's remember after scaling. And I've centered everything at the origin. Then I put my circles. So this green circle is centered at A with radius two and the blue one is centered at B with radius two. And then my inner magenta colored circle. 
And now let's notice that since we're assuming AB is the longest side of our triangle, we know that C has to be in this I formed by the intersection of those two green and blue circles. I've called that E2 for like event E2. Then since angle ACB is obtuse, we know that C is in fact inside this magenta inner circle. So I've called that E1, so that's like event E1. And so in fact, what we're trying to calculate here is the probability that event E1 occurs given that event E2 occurs. I think this is the order you put these things in. So we're assuming that E2 occurs and then we're gonna find the probability that E1 occurs given that other event has already occurred. But since we can assume that it's equally likely for any of these points to be landed on by C, in fact, what we're really looking here for is a ratio of areas. So this will end up being the area of this magenta circle over the area of the eye. So I'll just put I for the eye there. Now let's immediately notice that the area of the magenta circle is fairly simple to calculate because that's a circle with radius one. So by the standard formula for the area of a circle, that is simply the number pi. But the area of this I is a little bit trickier and we'll actually use calculus to calculate the area of this I. So what we'll do is envision it as the area under a curve. And under what curve you might say? Well, it's gonna be under this green circle. So it's this little arc of this green circle going from x equals zero to x equals one. But what's the equation of this green circle? Well, since it's centered at negative one and has radius of two, that's fairly easy to write down. This will be x plus one squared plus y squared equals four. Great, but we can solve for y and we'll get y is equal to plus minus the square root of four minus x plus one squared, like that. But then, since we can use symmetry here, all we need to do is calculate what's going on in the first quadrant and then multiply by four. So in that case, I'll just take the positive portion of the square root. So that means the area that we're interested in here is in fact four times the integral from zero to one of the square root of four minus x plus one quantity squared dx. So if we can calculate that integral, then we're good to go. Okay, so let's do that. So here's where we ended up. Our goal probability was pi over the area of the i that we had drawn on the last board. Then we wrote the area of that i in terms of an integral. It was four times the integral from zero to one of the square root of four minus x plus one squared. And now we'll complete this with trigonometric substitution. So the substitution we'll make is x plus one equals two times the sine of theta. Notice that means that the square root of four minus x plus one squared is in fact two times cosine theta by the Pythagorean trig identity. So let's also notice when x is equal to zero, we see that sine of theta is equal to one half, which means that theta equals pi over six. So that's how our bound of integration will change. Let's also notice when x is equal to one, we get sine of theta is equal to, let's see, also one, which means theta equals pi over two. So that's our other bound of integration. That wraps up almost everything that we need. We also need our dx. So our dx by differentiating this formula will be two times cos theta d theta. 
And this is everything we need to change this from an x integral to a theta integral. So let's see what it looks like. So we'll end up with something like this. We've got a four from here, a two from here, and a two from here. I'm gonna bring one of those twos out and leave one inside. We'll see why we do that along the way. So that'll give us eight times the integral from, this will be pi over six up to pi halves. And then we'll have a two and a cosine squared theta d theta. One cosine from the square root of four minus that stuff and one cosine from the dx. But now we'll use a semi well-known trigonometric identity, something that you'd probably learn in a pre-calculus or trigonometry class. And that is that we can rewrite two cosine squared as cosine of two theta plus one. So it's something like a power reducing formula. Okay, so that's gonna end up giving us eight, and then we have the integral from pi over six to pi over two of the cos of two theta plus the number one d theta. Now we can take the antiderivative fairly easily. That'll give us eight, and then we'll have one half sine of theta plus theta, then we need to evaluate this from pi over six to pi over two. Sorry, that shouldn't be sine of theta, that should be sine of two theta. But from here, that's just plugging numbers in and doing a little bit of arithmetic. I'll let you guys check that. But what you end up with is eight pi over three minus two times the square root of three. So that means we can take this area of i and replace it with the number that we've just calculated. In other words, eight pi over three minus two times the square root of three. But I think if we multiply the numerator and the denominator by three, we'll have something that's a little nicer. We'll have three pi over eight pi minus six times the square root of three. And that has a little bit better of a feel to it. And that's what I would take as maybe the best form of our final solution. So if you've liked this problem, I think I've done some other problems that you might like on the channel as well. In particular, there's one where I calculate the average distance between two points in a unit square. It's harder than it sounds. That should be on the screen right now if you'd like to check it out. And that's a good place to stop.